afternoon. Uh, magandang hapon. Maraming salamat for having me here today. Uh, about 60, 70, more than seven years ago, George Santayana said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to relive it or condemned to repeat it. Uh, the corollary for banking and for investing is that if we remember the past and if we study it well, how do we make money off of it? Uh, if we're going to study the last couple hundred years of market cycles to understand where the market may be going today, uh, we would have to start with this. Uh, we'd have to start with looking at this chart, which occurred in 1929. And let me see if this clicker works. Uh, and that's the Dow Jones Industrials peaking in 1929. Uh, if we understand the run-up to 1929 and what things coincided with that, and we understand what made it collapse and what made it go sideways for another several six, six seven, eight years, we might better understand what's happening in the United States and the Philippines and global markets today. Um, very similar looking chart. I would argue that if I show you this chart, it would hard to be, it'd be hard to understand whether this chart matched uh, the last one, this actually is the NASDAQ, the tech industry in the United States, peaking in 2000. If I put these on top of each other, I'd suggest you wouldn't know the difference. And if I actually overlay them on top of each other, you wouldn't know which was which. This pattern repeats itself over and over and over again in every market, in every major security, around the world, all the time. And if we understand that, we can say, where are we today? Uh, this, again, the same picture. And below it, uh, I'm showing an actual picture from an EKG of a heartbeat pattern. Now, whether it's because humans are running the stock market, and this is a coincidence or not, doesn't really matter to me. I don't care as long as we can use it to make money. The gold, this is gold peaking in 1980. And you see in that same heartbeat pattern, bouncing off and sideways again. And this is the FXI. Anyone know what the FXI is? It's the index for China. That's the peak just before 888, around the Olympics, just before 888. And you see the exact same pattern. I don't think if we didn't label it, you'd be able to tell the difference. You have to look from enough uh, of a distance, you have to make sure you don't miss the forest for the trees. But what we see is a pattern that's very, very distinct. And that is the Philippines peaking in 2013. Awfully similar pattern. Not the exact same liquidity. So the less liquidity you have in a market, it'll start to fracture a bit from the, the picture. But you see the same peak in 2013. You see the same roll off. And you see it pop back up. And the question is, of course, what's going to happen now? Now, before we talk about that, I like to say, and it's very relevant, this picture, another very, very similar looking picture, which happens to be the United States peaking in 2007. And with that peak, we'd say, where does things go? Is that OK for the next 20 minutes if I talk about that? Yes. Um, now, a little bit more complex, and I'll say we're going to provide the slides, so I'm introducing some concepts that I think you'll want to study afterwards, and we'll give you the slides so that you can, but just to show them, this is what we call a market phase cycle, and it shows the first and second stages of a bull market. The first stage of a bull is value-driven. The second stage is growth-driven, meaning in the first stage, you buy cheap stocks and you do well. In the second stage, you buy, frankly, more expensive stocks, but that are growing like crazy, and you also do well, up and until it peaks, there's a bubble, there's a double top almost always, capitulation, and then a bear rally that then leads to sideways market. Um, the most important concepts, if we look at these cycles over the last 200 plus years, is understanding what drives the markets. And naturally, corporate profit is one of them. Multiple expansion is another that we see occur going into bull markets. That sounds simple enough, but we'll take a look. Um, there's nothing new on Wall Street. Speculation is as old as the hills. So what we're arguing is that there's nothing new that we're going to see in the Philippine market that we haven't seen in every other market. Therefore, we ought to be able to use the same indicators. Uh, these quotes were stated by Jesse Livermore, 
who made, I don't know, $100 million in the stock market, hundreds of millions of dollars actually. He made $100 million in one year alone, but that was back in 1907. So when he made these comments, he was already saying that the prior 100 years always had the same kind of cycles. And he was a genius, literally a genius at understanding these markets. What he noticed was, what Jesse Lieberman noticed was, the importance of understanding credit. You can't be a good equity analyst. You can't be a good stock investor if you don't follow and understand credit markets. There is no better indicator for understanding whether we're in a bull market or a bear market than the credit markets in telling us whether or not companies will have the ability to grow or will have trouble growing or will they see multiple expansion or multiple compression. And so we're gonna focus on the credit cycle, which the credit cycle is not just credit, it's credit easing, companies then taking out credit, taking out debt, issuing bonds, and then using that capital to invest and that we see net new investment. So following that credit cycle from taking out debt to then spending it on new investment is a cycle that we wanna watch. The reason we wanna watch this is that without a firm handle on the flexibility that credit provides a company, without a firm understanding of credit, we'd argue you can't fully understand the wealth creation process. You can't understand whether or not we're in a bull or bear market. That statement was made by a colleague of mine named Mitch Julis. He runs $20 million, $20 billion at Canyon Capital out of LA. Uh, last year, he made 150 million US personally. It's a two-man partnership, so they actually made 300 million and they, they split it 50-50. Um, what was he talking about? He was saying, let's follow the credit markets. One thing that we noticed in the United States, and we'll show this and we'll use the same framework for showing what's happening in the Philippines, um, you see coverage ratios. So aggregate cash flow available to pay interest is at 10, and if I showed you more than this, more than 15, 20 year highs. The ability for companies to take out debt, the credit worthiness of companies is at absolute top levels. The balance sheets of US companies are extremely strong, amazingly strong. The amount of cash on the books just to pay off the first year's debt, meaning how many companies have zero chance of default because no matter what happens to a company, even if they lose all their revenues, if they have cash, enough cash to make all their debt payments in the first year, there's no default. And we're looking at the highest levels of companies that have more cash than their first, and if I showed other charts, more than a second, more than a third year, meaning very, very, very strong balance sheets. This is the commercial industrial loan market which is at peaks. Um, that means banks are lending to corporations at incredible levels, which I don't know if you noticed, but notice the credit market peaking. As the credit market rises, so goes the stock market. When the credit market collapses, so does the stock market. And there generally is a nine month to 18 month lead time of watching debt markets to understand what's gonna happen to the stock market. We ought to be doing the same thing in the Philippines. Again, commercial industrial loans are up. Consumer loans are always lagging. We want to focus on the companies getting debt, taking out debt, and spending it on good things. Uh, and then finally, the banks are very safe. The US banks look like, I mean, after the Asia financial crisis, pretty much every bank in Asia shored up their reserves, made sure they were very safe, lowered their leverage levels. That's what you're seeing in the United States. So while the US is at peak levels of lending, the banks, it looks like it's going to continue going higher and higher and higher because the banks have the ability to lend. And this very simple, this is what uh, Jesse Livermore did back in the early 1900s. He simply did a survey. He went around to various banks and he said, uh, can I get a loan for a million dollars? What would it take? And if it was very easy, he said, wow, it must be a very accommodative credit market. If people said, we're not gonna give you a million, we'll give you 100,000. Well, we'll give you 100,000 if you have a million dollars in the bank account. Meaning we'll only loan you money if you already have the money. Right, which you know there are times like that and there are times like that in the Philippines if we go back uh, just a few years where it's very, very tight money policy. Uh, the gray bars are recessions. I don't know of another metric, single metric, that has such a relationship and if we went back to Jesse Livermore's days going back 130, 140 years, that credit tightening, this red line, when it's very hard to get loans, you see recessions. When it's very easy to get loans, that's all the survey was. Is it easy to get a loan or difficult? If it's very easy, you see the stock market, the blue line going through the roof. This is back in the 1990s. 
if credit markets are very tough to get loans, you see a recession, stock market collapses. If it's very easy to get loans, it's very common if stock market goes up. Um, and over the last few years, since 2009, you see the stock market in the States going up a lot and a very accommodative credit policy that's going to continue for another two, three, four years. So the threat of market collapse in the United States that you hear about so often in the news, I would suggest to you is nonsense. It's nonsense. There's no data to back it up. Uh, they talk about valuations. They talk about other things. Unless they talk about a firm understanding of credit driving the equity markets, don't believe the news when it says that the U.S. stock market is expensive and is going to collapse. We'd actually suggest to you that if we study, if we study profitability in the United States, you'll actually see why we see such a healthy U.S. stock market and not by following earnings. It's not earnings that matter, it's quality earnings. And by quality earnings, let me show this. This is regular earnings. This is um, over the, the, every quarter back to 1988. And what you notice is during this period you have 10 quarters in a row where earnings are falling. This is aggregate corporate earnings falling and the stock market going up, the red line handling during that time period. This is another period where earnings were flat for eight quarters straight, and during that flat period, the stock market went up 20 plus percent. This is a period where earnings were going up and the stock market was actually rolling over and falling. So while we need to study earnings, we need to study quality earnings, and we'll show a simple method for doing that. This is a period where earnings were going up and the stock market was collapsing. Here's where earnings were at the lowest point in 20 years, and that was the single best time to buy stocks in the United States, maybe in the last 20 years also. So we need to study quality earnings, not just earnings. And by quality earnings, we're saying we need to study a return on assets. It's very simple. If a company says they're growing by 20 pesos, their earnings, the question is, well, how much did you put in assets? Did you put 100 assets, 100 pesos in assets in place? 20 pesos growth, but they put it in place $100 in assets or 100 pesos, you'd say, well, that's 20% return. If they put 1,000 pesos in place to produce those 20 pesos, 20 over 1,000, it's a 2% return. Both are 20 pesos. One is quality, one is not. And what we're suggesting is by studying the return on assets, by just studying the earnings relative to the balance sheet, relative to the assets being spent, we can understand whether the quality earnings are there or not. In this case, in the United States, and why we've been so bullish, is that the United States now has an 11% return on assets. That's a real number. So that's lower than if, if we included inflation. We took inflation out of all these numbers. That is a 60-year high. United States firms have never, in recorded history of 10Ks being issued, had such profitability levels. It's off the charts. It's amazing. So you have very, very safe balance sheets, very accommodative credit policy, credit, easy to get debt, and the highest return on assets we've seen, which means the earnings growth is not from the companies just spending money to grow earnings. It's because they're doing it in a very safe, solid, stable way, which tends to continue. When we look at that relative to this book, The Art of Value Investing, which basically is an interesting book. It's just quotes from the greatest investors of the last 30, 40 years. So it's quoting people like Mitch Julis and Chuck Royce and uh, um, Joel Greenblatt, a number of investors that have done very well. And just a couple of quotes. Management teams that truly understand the cost of capital, meaning do they generate a return on assets higher than the cost of the capital? Meaning are they spending so much in capital assets? Sustainable ability to generate returns, returns that exceed the cost of capital. Earn high returns. They're talking about return on assets. These four quotes are from four different investors. In fact, when you read through all their quotes, all the great investors say the same thing over and over again, which is you only create shareholder value if the earnings come in at a high return on assets. If you have a high earnings growth on a low return on assets, it is not quality earnings. And every great investor, including Buffett, when you go back over 50, 60, 70 years, you've said, what have they done to be successful? It's this quality earnings notion, which is based on return on assets. So when you look at the United States with this high return on assets, 
Um, very stable asset growth. So they're not spending a lot in assets to generate those high returns. We can then look at the valuation multiples. So the US has a lot of great companies, but how are valuations? Value to assets is like a price to book. It's a cleaned up price to book calculation, valuation to asset level. And while it's going up, on a value to earnings level, we're looking at levels that are 10 year lows. So you have super high quality companies with stable growth with fairly low multiples, All right. which bodes well for the Philippines also if the US is in such good shape, which it is. Um, correlations are also very low. The re what correlation is it says, are stocks all moving together? Are they highly correlated? Or are stocks moving as individual companies? When there's huge market collapse, all stocks fall. That means it doesn't matter the, how high quality one firm is versus another. The high correlation suggests that it doesn't matter how good a stock picker you are, everything goes up and down at the same time. Right now in the States, we have very low correlations historically, which means it's a very good stock picker's market. Just, I know Nona, you don't know me, most of you. <laughs> Um, I'm on the board of COL. I, um, uh, we have been doing equity research for many, many years now um, at the urging of our clients because in 2008, our analysis said uh, that stocks were going to collapse. In 2009, it said buy stocks. And our clients said, you need to run money. You need to actually put your money where your mouth is. So we launched a fund in 2011 um, called Kennebec River Capital. Um, in the first month and a half, if I point at the bottom, in the first month and a half, when we launched at the end of 2011, we did 3%, not bad for a month and a half, to do a 3% return on very low volatility and very diversified portfolio. Um, in 2012, we did over 30%, and our net long position was not 100%. I mean, we had large cash balances. Uh, in 2013, using the methodology I'm talking about, uh, we did another 27% return, 28%. Our compounded return, uh, not compounded, our cumulative return is over 70% since we launched two years and two months ago. And in the first two and a half months as of today, we're up another four and a half percent while the stock market in the US has gone sideways. The reason I bring this up, yes, I'm bragging a little bit, but it's, it's, I'm also saying this methodology works is because it leads us to where we see the Philippines. Because right now we believe the United States is a sideways market. We don't believe it's expensive. We don't think that there could be a market collapse because a market collapse needs to be accompanied by a credit crunch and we have no sign of a credit crunch coming whatsoever. Um, that means when the stock market rolls over two or three, four percent, when it falls, we're buyers and we've been buying. So we bought heavily in late, July, in late January and it's done well. The reason I bring this up is sideways markets can be phenomenal stock picking markets and that's where we see the Philippines today. That even if you believe that the market as a whole in the Philippines, which we do, may be fairly valued, and even in some issues a little bit expensive, we're seeing low correlations. So what I mean by that is, where is the PSEI headed? Where is the stock market in the Philippines headed in general? And we're first going to focus on credit. What we see is a very accommodative credit environment. Despite the fact that up until 2003, 2004, commercial industrial loans were falling. And this makes it difficult. When you don't have debt, which is generally much cheaper than issuing equity, it increases your cost of capital to companies, it makes it more expensive for them to grow, it makes it hard for them to invest. What we've been seeing since 2004 is a very, very accommodative credit environment in the Philippines, which I think all of you know based on credit issuances. Bond issuances are oversubscribed, right? banks, it's getting easier and easier to get a loan, even as a consumer, let alone as a business in the Philippines. The bond rating of the Philippines in general improved. What we're seeing is a very accommodative credit environment. So one, that means it's laying the groundwork for the Philippines to have done well over those several years. Um, and it also means that there's no threat of market collapse because market collapse will always, 95% of the time, be accompanied by a credit crunch and we see nothing like that happening in, in the Philippines. Um, capacity utilization. As this has happened since 2004, and as the stock market in the Philippines has done so well and ramped up during that time period with some volatility, we also see companies using up any excess capacity. They're using their assets very well. They're getting higher returns, more sales for each dollar of assets in place. So these are well-run businesses uh, that we're seeing up until this point. The problem is when you start hitting 80 to 85% capacity utilization, meaning where companies are using their assets, they need to start spending to grow. And that's where it gets concerning because we want to make sure is the spending coming in 
at a high quality earnings level or is the spending coming in at lower quality earnings level? Right? And that's where an inflection point in that way in the Philippines right now. Um, now we focus on corporate profits. Are they increasing? And what do we see for multiple expansion? Um, we see a 6% average ROA for the Philippines. The average ROA for China over the last seven, eight, nine years, 6%. The average ROA for Hong Kong over the last six, seven years, 6%. The global corporate average over 50 years has been 6%. So the issue is that what we're seeing is Philippine companies, the net investment going in is net neutral from a value creation policy standpoint. And that's the concerning issue. That's what the great investor would say is they want to make sure they're buying companies that have returned well above global averages. Global averages being 6%, Philippine corporate average is 6%. It makes it iffy on whether or not to buy the corporate averages, meaning the Philippine stock market in general. It's predictive of a sideways market, much like we're seeing in the United States. Growth has been fantastic. The problem is, when you have 12% earnings growth, if the earnings growth is accompanied by return on assets of 6%, that earnings growth does not result in multiple expansion. It results in a sideways market. I wish I could say differently. I mean, I love to say everyone go out and buy every stock that there is, but, um, and it would have been the case three years ago or four years ago. But right now, we're seeing a sideways market continuing. If we follow that heartbeat pattern, if we follow those major market cycles we've seen for the last 100 years, we're seeing the same setup for volatile but sideways. That doesn't mean the Philippine market won't go up and down 5% here and there, depending on news and depending on um, uh, what happens. But uh, we're saying that sideways is the best guess. Valuations uh, have run up in terms of multiples since 2008, as we know. And even on a cleaned up, what we call a valuation to earnings as opposed to a PE, price to earnings, valuation to earnings, trading around 22, that requires growth, meaning the growth of 10, 12% of earnings that we're expecting from Philippine companies is priced in. We're actually expecting that to happen. The market valuations are at that level already. The great thing about this is that we see far lower correlation. Remember correlation, are the stocks trading together or are they trading as individuals? In the Philippines, they're trading far more as individual stocks than even in the United States by a long shot. What that means is sideways markets from an equity standpoint can be phenomenal stock picking markets. Phenomenal. I mean, it's what we've made our money on the last couple of years. As the market's gone up in the US and then has gone sideways, we're doing as well or even better in the sideways market than we were when everything was going up in terms of outperformance. What we want to focus on is buying in the Philippines, like everywhere else in the world, is buying into management teams that understand cost of capital and capital allocation. That understand it's not just earnings growth that matters, it's generating earnings at a return in excess of 6%, in excess of that global corporate average. If I had inflation, it would be around 10% for those of you that do cost of capital analysis. But without inflation, it's six. It's a real number. Right. So to create shareholder value, we want to see companies that are doing that. Um, I just want to show this chart because there's a notion, especially in emerging markets, that EPS growth leads to higher price to earnings multiples. So high EPS growth, we should see a high PE. Low EPS growth, we should see a low PE. If that were the case, we ought to see virtually a straight line from the bottom left to the top right. If we just mapped Philippine companies, and I think in this chart we mapped 60 or so, or 50 plus, and what you get is, a, is frankly a mess. That there is no relationship. The reason there's no relationship is there's nowhere you understand is the earnings growth that you're seeing in a company, high quality or low quality. If it's high quality earnings growth, yes, it gets a high PE. If it's low quality earnings growth, meaning a low return on assets, you end up with a low PE. And so the same earnings per share growth metric can be accompanied by high or low and doesn't give us an understanding of valuation. We need to do more than just understand earnings, we understand quality earnings. And if I map the return on assets, these are Philippine companies as of last week. You see an amazing relationship, meaning the higher the quality earnings, the higher the ROA, 
the higher the valuation. Lockstep. And it's looked this way every year. Now, what's interesting is there are lots of companies that are trading with a frankly high ROA trading at low valuations. Meaning they're getting earnings growth, but it's very, very high quality. And for some reason, the market hasn't seen it yet. And we also have other companies that are very, very expensive, you'd argue. They have earnings growth, but that earnings growth is coming in at a low ROA. When we map these two together, we have a basis for saying there's no reason you can't do in the Philippines phenomenal stock picking simply by focusing on what the same concepts are that the great investors have focused on in the past, which is buying high quality earnings companies with a high ROA. So whether the Philippine stock market over the next couple of years will go sideways or up or down depends on the aggregate of all the companies, and that's awfully hard to judge. Right now, it looks like the aggregate is 6%. It has been 6%. My gut tells me, based on our work globally over the last, I don't know, 15 years or so, um, that the Philippine market is more or less going to be sideways with volatility. That means it's a fantastic stock picker's market. Buying companies with strong balance sheets, meaning not at risk of taking out too much debt, not at risk of credit issues, buying high quality earnings at reasonable valuations, and there's no reason that everyone in here can't outperform the market averages in the stock market by buying up companies in that way. Uh, that's our presentation. You know, we believe in education also, uh, as, as COL does. Um, we do programs on these content. I know some of these slides are a bit heavy. I know some of the content was a bit heavy, but uh, if you're interested in it, um, you can sign up with us, and uh, we do virtually free presentations, very, very cheap anyway. And we donate all the money it's just to make sure that people show up um, at the presentations. And we do them in the COL's training room uh, at BSC Tech Tight. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I hope it leads you to believe you can all be great stock pickers uh, using this framework. Thank you so much for your time.